Hello and welcome back to the show. I'm your host, Rebecca Larson. We've been revisiting some older episodes from the archives, and here's one that's not particularly Tudor. I mean, at any point, you can somehow narrow it down to descendants of the Tudors, probably. However, this is a Stuart Queen, and to me, it's one of the most fascinating Stuart Queens there is. And that is Henrietta Maria, the wife of King Charles I. And today, I am happy to invite back Leanda Delisle to talk to us about this fascinating woman. The Tudor's Dynasty Podcast. So let's get to it. Let's learn about this amazing woman. Henrietta Maria was a French princess. She was born in the first decade of the 17th century and was the daughter of King Henry IV of France. So for those who are trying to connect the dots to England, this was after King James of Scotland became James I of England. So how are the two connected? Well, today I welcome back longtime friend of the show, Leanda Delisle, to give us the story of Henrietta Maria. Leanda, welcome back. It's lovely to be back. Thank you for asking me. I am so excited to talk about Henrietta today, and there is so much territory to cover. So let's start from the beginning, but let's keep it brief because she has a fantastic story, and I want to make sure that we cover it all. I'll try. Well, let's begin with her childhood then. And as I had mentioned, she was the daughter of Henry IV of France, but she never knew her father, did she? No, he was uh, murdered. He was assassinated when she was six or seven months old. Is there any backstory you can give us on that to kind of give us an idea of maybe what her early childhood was like? Um, yes, certainly. So he was he's remembered as Henry the Great of France, a great warrior king. Uh, he fought in the sort of wars of religion, Catholics versus Protestants in France. He actually represented the Protestant cause for a while. Um, and um, but as he was poised in victory, uh, he uh, converted uh, to Catholicism uh, because the majority of the French were Catholic. And he was reputed to have said that Paris was worth a mass. But anyway, he became a Catholic and he then created a France where you could practice your religion freely if you were a Protestant or a Catholic. And he looked outwards, I suppose, like a lot of sort of great kings. And he saw the, the rival dynasty in Europe were the Habsburgs, who were also Catholics. Uh, but um, I suppose having been a Protestant himself once, he was very happy to go into alliance with Protestant powers uh, 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 to defeat the Habsburgs, to become stronger than the Habsburgs. And um, not everyone liked this. There was um, uh, a young uh, Catholic fanatic who was, in fact, raving mad. But anyway, he was one of those who disapproved of Henry IV making an alliance uh, with a, with Protestant powers against uh, the Catholic Habsburgs and so stabbed him to death in his coach. Mm. Henrietta Maria's mother, Marie de Medici, uh, Maria, she was called Henry after her father and Maria after her mother, so Henrietta Maria, became regent of France and was an extraordinary woman, very powerful figure, a woman ruling France, which had a Salic law, which meant no woman could inherit the throne. So it was very, you know, it was quite sort of extraordinary what she was doing. And um, she was an extraordinary sort of powerful figure, Marie de Medici. And she, she it, actually it was shaped a lot of sort of French culture. So a lot of what we think about French culture, French association with luxury goods and things, she... Um, you know, was 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 a sort of kickstarted, you might say. I think that was the perfect backstory for Henrietta's later life because I think at, the more we talk today, the more the listeners are going to realize how important that part of her life was as well. So, wh what was her childhood like after her father was assassinated? You mentioned that her mother became regent for her brother. But what kind of childhood did she have? Was she still raised like a French princess? Was she still educated the same? Uh, yes, um, she had um, uh, really well. She had, sort of, I suppose you could say uh, she had her education, education as we might think about it. But also, of course, she had what she saw going on around her. So one of her earliest memories uh, would have been uh, when her brother, uh, age of 16, overthrew her mother's regency and um, murdered her mother's favourite, 
um, or had him had had him assassinated. And the the, the favourite's uh, wife, who was her mother's sort of best friend, who used to do her hair every day, uh, was burned at the stake. So she, you know, she had some pretty sort of traumatic experiences. Her mother was put was was put into internal exile, so she didn't see her for several years. Then her mother, who was a very extraordinary woman, then eventually managed to sort of wheedle herself back into her son's uh, good good books and uh, became very powerful again. On the terms of her education, her mother brought her up, I suppose, to know how to handle herself on the public stage. She learned to act and sing and talk on stage uh, from a very early age, even to help sort of produce plays. Uh, and her mother very much felt that a woman had a right to um, a sort of public voice and also to have a say, I suppose, in how countries were run in power, that women had some right to power. Because it was very much believed that women were the sort of heirs to Eve and that Eve, you know, was 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 uh, obviously evil, that she had seduced Adam in the Garden of Eden and um, and so had brought about the fall and had brought evil into the world and women were viewed as kind of weak and um, because they had been seduced by the devil in the Garden of Eden and manipulative because, you know, they had seduced Adam into evil and so forth. It's a, it's a rather unappealing story if you're a woman. And Marie de Medici very much sort of encouraged her daughters to think rather more about another biblical story, a different biblical story, which gave women a rather, <laughs> rather better press, uh, which was the story of the redeemed Eve, uh, the second Eve, the, which who is the Virgin Mary, the mother of Christ. And she quoted philosophers who said that Christ being, you know, Mary's child would obey Mary even. And so that, you know, women and that had held power in heaven as the queen of heaven and that women, therefore, um, you know, had a, had a, had a, could have a place of honour and even hold power on earth. And I think that was important as well. You have to bear in mind that, you know, women were constantly told that we're sort of second best. Right. So one of the things um, that I find interesting is that she was a princess of France. And even though her father was assassinated, her brother was the king of France, her mother was the regent. And so she was still a, an important political chess piece in, oh, yeah. in Europe. Let's talk a little bit about her marriage negotiations, because as a princess, those usually start pretty early in life. How many connections did she have? I mean, her father was executed or assassinated so early on in her life. Did she only have one marriage match or were there others that came about before him? Well, she was the youngest. She was the last child of her parents. And so uh, she had seen her two older sisters married before her. The first uh, was married off as a, as a young, in her early teens to uh, the heir to the you know, uh, King of Spain, the Habsburg, Habs, the Habs, great Habsburg monarch, Philip IV, as he became. Then her sister, aged 13 and scarcely adolescent, was married to the heir to the Duke de Savoy, Prince Piedmont. For these were all for dynastic reasons. Her mother actually wanted to have sort of peace in Europe, um, particularly between the Catholic powers, which is why she married her elder daughter to a Habsburg. Um, and the next one was then married by um, by Henrietta Maria's brother, in fact, uh, to um, you know into this into the Italian into this Italian house, um, because they were the sort of buffer state, um, I suppose, between France and Habsburg Spain, uh, and then. It looked like Henrietta Maria might be married in France to a, you know, to one of the French princely families. Um, and I think that's what she probably rather hoped. But her mother and brother uh, decided that um, that it would be useful for France if she was married to um, the heir to the to the crowns of England and Scotland, who was, you know, Prince Charles son of James the sixth and first. And I am fascinated by this connection because at the time in England, England was more Protestant, was it not? Yes, England was very Protestant. Uh, England was the leading Protestant um, power. But from Henrietta Maria's perspective, it looked it was going to be essentially um, an alliance because at the time there were tensions again between uh, and and indeed fighting going on. There were tensions between France uh, you near know, the Bourbon France and Habsburg Spain and the, and the and Habsburgs in 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 Central Europe as well. And um, so she saw this marriage 
In terms of her father's history of alliances with Protestants against the Habsburgs, she saw it in that light. And she also hoped that, um, and indeed her mother hoped and uh, the Pope hoped, that it might encourage the new King Charles, who was about to become king, you know, or, or future King Charles, uh, by the time she married him, he was king, encourage him to stop persecuting Catholics because they were also the leading, pers- the British crown were also the leading persecutors of Catholics in Europe. And um, it was quite a severe persecution. And um, so she hoped that, you know, that King Charles might introduce something similar to what her father had introduced in France, which was these things called the Edicts of Nantes, under which you could practice your religion freely if you were Catholic or a Protestant. I think that's fascinating. How, okay, so when they got married, she was rather young. I mean, by today, yeah, yeah, okay. So by today's standards, we would say young, but by the royal princess standards, 15 wasn't all that young, was it? No, but it was, I I think the point is what we think about, isn't it, is let's put it bluntly, is whether or not you're going to have sex when you're 15 um, with a grown up man, with a grown male. Um, So when her sister married, in Spain, uh, she was not obliged to consummate the marriage until she was, uh, you know, I think. Um, This wasn't always the case. Sometimes they would do it earlier. Um, I I think, you know, the middle sister, uh, Christine uh, in Savoy, did have to consummate her marriage at age 13, and and Henrietta Maria had to do it at age 15. And I think she was probably quite physically, physically an immature 15-year-old, so it's really slightly gross thinking about it, because she didn't have she didn't become pregnant for several years. And I suspect this was because she wasn't physically mature enough to do so, which does sort of make one think, you know. <laughs> well, most definitely. And he was, what, a, a decade older than she was? Yeah, he was exactly. So he was an adult of 25, yes. Wow. So do we have any idea what they had in common, Charles and Henrietta Maria? Um. Well, I think, well, <laughs> what they had in common, that's a very interesting question. Um. Because they had so they were so they were so different in many ways. I think they both had a sense of humor. Um, I think that probably helped. Um, I think she had more of a sense of humor than he did, but he could be quite funny. So I think they shared a sense of humor. They were both naturally extremely affectionate and loving people. I think he was much she was much more flamboyant and obviously warm and you know gay she was by na- by nature gay one of her friends later said about her whereas charles was was very shy couldn't read people very easily was very socially awkward um and she wasn't but 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 he was nevertheless very devoted to those he was close to and um so they had the, they, they had a great so they both shared i suppose they were both warm people loving people and that obviously helped when they have they started off the marriage started off extremely rocky um, but they did fall in love and they became extremely devoted to each other. So I think they had that in common. Oh, and they also had, I suppose they also loved, both loved beauty and music. And um, although they liked, slightly, they had different tastes in art. Uh, Henrietta Maria liked modern art and Charles preferred the old masters. But they both loved art. They loved music. They loved the theatre. Henrietta Maria enjoyed performing and talking on stage. Charles stopped her from doing that in the end, from talking, that is, on stage, because his, you know, people in England complained about it. They didn't like seeing women talk on stage. <laughs> of course. Uh, getting a bit uppity, you know, <laughs> dressing as men. Oh, my God. <laughs> Very bad. Um, doing such things. So, yes, they had those sort of things in common. And, of course, they were both royal. And both had a very strong sense of, their, of who they were. I love how you just briefly skimmed over their relationship was rocky at the beginning. I think I think we need to touch base on this a little bit more. Yes. For those who are unfamiliar, why would you say it was rocky? Right. Okay, well, so this poor girl arrives age 15 with these hopes, one of which, as I mentioned, well, she's hoping, first of all, that she's going to encourage good relations between England and France against the Habsburgs, and she's hoping that, that she's going to ease persecution of Catholics. So she arrives just when relations between England and France are collapsing and people are blaming Charles's favourite, the Duke of Buckingham, his sort of best mate. Favourites are not really best friends of Queen's on the whole because they see them as potential rivals for the King's ear. 
And um, so, so Buckingham's keen to blame things like the collapse of the French alliance on, on Henrietta Maria. And um, Charles wants to protect his favourite, who's being attacked in Parliament uh, from these attacks, and to sort of please his MPs, uh, who are quite, you know, ferociously anti-Catholic on the whole, um, he continues and even increases the persecution of Catholics, which he had promised in the marriage negotiations to lessen. So she gets very annoyed about this. And also she insists on being, you know, she is French. She's surrounded by uh, all her French you know, ladies in waiting and sort of best friends and things. And they continue behaving in a very French way, which means they have a lovely time. They enjoy good conversations. They're not very formal. You know, they just just quite casual and enjoy having a good time. And Charles is very formal. He's formalized the English court. He likes things. He's, you know, he's a bit got a bit of a poker up his bottom, the young Charles. And, um, you know, so that upsets him and distresses him. And so they end up having furious rows. And of course, she is a teenager as well. You have to remember she's 15 and she's a teenager in a way we might recognize. So she loses her temper in a very dramatic teenage way, saying you know, she's right, saying that she wants to die that he's so horrible, you know, that she, she's going to die of misery and unhappiness unless she's allowed to go home. And and they have an argument in bed one night when she, she says she wants him to make, you know, her sort of French friends run her estates in England. And he says you know, perfectly fairly, no, she can't can't do that. They can only, she can only have English people running her English estates. And then she sort of completely loses her temper and she sort of shouts at him that, you know, her life is miserable, and horrible, and it's all, everything is his fault. And I love that. I think to myself, gosh, you know, how many teenagers have shouted out, it's all your fault, everything is your fault, you're horrible to me, and everything's all your fault. He's completely sort of stunned by this. He can't believe that, you know, his wife is talking to him, the King of England, you know, and a divine right monarch <laughs> like this. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, they do have some good humdingers. And he sends her household home, all her friends home, uh, which she sort of actually she almost has a breakdown at that point actually because she's left almost entirely on her own without any of her friends suddenly her ladies in waiting all these people she doesn't know or like one of them is uh, the mistress of you know the duke of buckingham who she hates and and she's been hurt, told and she's heard that this woman who's called lucy countess of carlisle um you know the buckingham wants to make her the king's mistress and you know she's a grown woman and one of the most attractive women at court what she called she's called a killing beauty the killing beauty of the age she's referred to as this woman and um so obviously that's very distressing for this you know young young girl mm. you had mentioned um how upset henrietta maria was by her french household being released was there a letter did I do I understand correctly that he um, Charles had written a letter to Henrietta Maria's brother and mother to inform them of what was happening? Yes, he did. And he well, he did. Um, he described them as wild beasts, uh, but not to not to not to the mother and brother to the mother and brother. He said, which was true. He said, you know, they're all going. I'm sending them all home. Um, and, you know, frankly, you know, the, that her sisters lost their French households fairly soon after they arrived in Spain and in Savoy, so that it shouldn't be any different for Henrietta Maria. And he had a perfectly good and reasonable point there. And everyone expected Henrietta Maria to calm down quite soon and sort of, you know, get on with things. Um, but um, she she was always, she was, <laughs> she was always, she used to admit, because she, she, I don't know if she had a sense of humour, but she, she did have a sense of humor about herself. She was always a bit of a sulker. And, you know, even as a little girl, she admitted she was, didn't always find things easy to let go. So she did sulk for a good long time about it uh, until really she was told by the French ambassador that she needed to, you know, make make amends with, with Charles, which she then did, actually. Um, and and, and um, it was shortly after that that... Something very sinister happened, I think, quite sinister happened when um, Buckingham, was, in which Buckingham was involved, in which it was sort of suggested that Henrietta, that Henrietta Maria's lute teacher had said that he could seduce her with the power of his music. And this man was arrested for, uh, as far as I remember, for a sort of attack on a the rape of a child. Um and it was very reminiscent of what happened with Anne Boleyn, of course, in Henry VIII, when Anne Boleyn was accused of adultery 
uh, with the musician Mark Smeaton. Um, and it's not impossible that um, Buckingham was trying to tar Henrietta Maria in the same way. But by the time this had happened, she had worked sufficiently well on her marriage that um, that Charles was in love with her. Whereas, whereas when it happened to Anne Boleyn, Henry VIII was falling out of love with Anne Boleyn and Anne Boleyn had, had, a, had recently had a miscarriage. And um, it marked the beginning of the end for Anne Boleyn, who was executed not long afterwards. Whereas Henrietta Maria survived this incident, which isn't very well known, but which I describe in my book. The Duke of Buckingham, <laughs> George Villiers, he yeah. he is so slimy. Every time I think of him, it reminds me of of you know James the First and Sixth and Anne of Denmark and his relationship in that court as well. And that just kind of transferred to his son's court, didn't it? It's so weird. Yes, I mean it was very interesting because there was a it was a different relationship, slightly odd, slightly kind of Freudian in a way. So. Buckingham was essentially was a, James and Buckingham, although there, you know, obviously one doesn't have photographic evidence of this, but they were basically having a sort of homosexual affair. James was a homosexual, bisexual, if you prefer, um, and um, was in love with uh, Jane, with um, Buckingham, who was an extremely good looking, very, very beautiful man. And uh, this is obviously quite difficult for Charles, who was in his teens when his when his father fell in love with Buckingham. They didn't get on particularly well. But um, Buckingham then realised that, of course, James was going to die and Charles was going to become king. And he didn't want to end up like Marie de Medici's favourite, i.e. being assassinated on the orders of the new king. So um, he started sucking up to Charles. And Charles, who was a sort of lonely boy, and as I said, not was rather socially awkward and so forth, suddenly found he had this incredibly sort of glamorous friend who was like a sort of big brother to him almost. Um, and supported him. And he would support him in, in political things against his father as well, against James. Um, so, yeah, so he, he is at the hence the sort of slightly sort of Freudian element. And so when when James died, Buckingham became was was Charles's favourite. I mean, there was no, no there was no sexual relationship between them. Charles was not homosexual, um, but um, but there was this incredibly close friendship, um, which was which was sort of supercharged, you might say, by this background. Mm. And then Henrietta Maria comes into the picture. And exactly. of course, she then pulls some of the attention of the king, one would think. Yes, exactly. Absolutely. I mean, so Buckingham was concerned about this. Um, and it's interesting that because Buckingham was, ap- was hated for the power he held and um, ends, up, uh, being assass- ends up being assassinated, um, and it's often said oh, that Henrietta Maria then becomes powerful, very powerful, influential with Charles after Buckingham is assassinated. But actually, the truth is she was already had already become so. That's something I draw attention to in my book before Buckingham's assassination. But of course, she has no she has no um, intimate rival after Buckingham's death. Mm. So you had mentioned that Charles and Henrietta Maria's relationship improved. So let's touch base on that a little bit and maybe look at the number of children they had, because that's usually a pretty good indicator of a decent relationship. Wouldn't you agree? Yes. Gosh, well, they had um, many. Um, let me think. So they had a little Charles who died. Then they had Charles who became the future Charles II, Mary, James, Elizabeth, Catherine. And they had another one of course, Anne who died. Um, so how many is that? I wasn't Any. counting five, six. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. No, absolutely. Um, yes. So she had, she did. Uh, uh, she was very successful. And of course, the main, the main task of a queen consort was to produce heirs, male heirs specifically, of course. And uh, she produced, um, and Henry, of course, so there was Henry. So there were how many sons who lived to adulthood? There were three sons who lived to adulthood. And two became king, right? Yes, and two became king, yeah. Right. And then did they have a youngest daughter who um, was also named Henrietta? Henrietta Anne, yes, her youngest, who was conceived during the middle of the Civil War. Um, and um, was it was it, hers is an extraordinary story as well. So she was she was conceived in the middle of the Civil War. Um, when Henrietta Maria was uh, in Oxford with Charles and Henrietta Maria became, 
his greatest and uh, most effective supporter, I think, actually during the Civil War. Um, and um, but you know she still had <laughs> she, she still had become she was still pregnant and had a baby. She had a baby when she was under siege in Exeter, and then she had to get back to France to help raise money and arms for her husband, whose situation was quite desperate. And she had to abandon and leave her baby in Exeter, which was awful. And, and I think one of the terrible things of anyone who's who's listening who's had children themselves is. Um, she describes how she has this terrible breast abscess when she arrives in France, um, which has to be sort of last. And it's very painful. And of course, if you don't breastfeed, um, you know, you're, 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 you get, you know, you get these breasts become very sore and painful. And, um, and it must have been a con the pain must have been a constant reminder that she was a, a new mother and she was in great distress about leaving her baby. Uh, with whom she was eventually uh, reunited. Her baby was smuggled out later during the Civil War by a lady in waiting. So she and she she brought her up in 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 France mm. um, and came very very close to her. And they were very close. She used to call her, um, you know, the, the little me. She was a mini me. She was a mini Henrietta. And um, even in were, portraits, you almost see that similarity too. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. They were and they were very close and um, shared many interests and. Um, Yes, they were sort of they were they were a devoted mother and daughter. It was a, it was a very sort of touching story, mm -hmm. really. Well, you've teased now about the Civil War, so now we have to go back a little bit and get to the point where that happens and where Henrietta has to flee. So, for those who are unfamiliar with the Civil War, maybe you can just give a brief synopsis of what that was about and when it happened. How did that affect the royal family? Well. Very un, <laughs> un, very unfairly. Henrietta Maria is often blamed for the Civil War. It's said she sort of turned Charles Catholic, and that this triggered the Civil War. It's one of the things that is said, and that she somehow encouraged his authoritarianism, his belief in the divine right of kings. Um, and it's it is odd how women are often blamed for the actions of their husband. I mean, you see it now um, with, say, Meghan Markle and 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 Harry, you know, Duke of Suffolk. And I don't know why people do this. I think maybe it's a whole Adam and Eve thing again. And, you know, Eve seducing Adam into evil. It's certainly true with Henrietta Maria. So just to sort of explain a bit. So Charles I believed in a divine right monarchy. He believed that, the, that God had made him king and that ultimately he was above the law and, that, um, and parliament. Um, he believed this. He'd been taught this by his father. Um, and it was essential, and it was also actually a very distinct, distinctly anti-Catholic form of um, divine right kingship, because he also believed, as his father had, that they were head of the Church of England and that the Pope had no authority. Um, this being the case, he believed that all his subjects should worship as he did. And that meant a, his own particular brand of Protestantism, which was then known as Arminianism. So Catholics were persecuted throughout his reign. Um, despite what people might believe or think. Henrietta Maria managed to ameliorate this a bit, so Catholic priests weren't executed um, for a period of years um, during their marriage, um, but they certainly couldn't just freely have go to go have mass, for example, and, and, uh, and were, had to pay fines if they, went, if they didn't go to Protestant services. But equally, he expected his Protestant subjects to adhere to his particular brand of Protestantism. So Puritans, for example, who didn't hold with his Arminianism, which was quite kind of high church. Um, you know, some of them went to America, for example, and they opposed him. And um, Charles quarreled with his parliaments about religion, but also about the Duke of Buckingham and, and the wars that he continued. He lost his wars against the French, against the Habsburgs. And um, he started, so he started ruling without parliament and would raise uh, taxes without parliament. Um, and then the final, but the, the, what, what started, what broke the camel's back, what opened the gateways to the civil war was that he decided he was going to impose his Arminian brand of Protestantism through a new prayer book on the Scots. Now, the Scots were Presbyterians. They believed the same sort of things as the Puritans. They were Calvinists, purer form of Calvin, purer form of Calvinism than the Church of England. And so they rebelled against him. And he was defeated. And so he had to have Parliament come back 
um, because he needed Parliament to raise taxes to buy the Scots off so they'd leave England, because Scotland and England, although they were united under the same crown, they were two different countries. They were independent nations under the same crown. They weren't the United Kingdom as, as we are now. And um, Parliament then started stripping him of power and it became more and more ferocious and, and more and more, and the radicals began to take over and um, they executed one of his leading ministers. And eventually the situation deteriorated to the point of civil war. Before, just before the civil war broke out, Henrietta Maria went to Holland uh, to take her daughter, Mary, um, who had been married to the son of the Prince of Orange in Holland, ostensibly to accompany her daughter. But in fact, she went to raise uh, money, men and arms for her husband. At this stage, as was 1642, everyone expected Charles to lose the civil war. Parliament, he'd already fled London. Parliament controlled London, which had most of it, the vast majority of England's wealth, power, and all that sort of area of England. So Parliament had the most men, the most money, the most arms, everything. And um, it, everyone assumed that Charles would be defeated in the first battle of the Civil War when it came. But Henrietta Maria managed to raise um, enormous amounts of uh, of of munitions for Charles, which he sent back to England for him. And so he survived this first battle, um, the Battle of Edge Hill in 1642. And um, Parliament realised that she was extremely dangerous and um, then made strong efforts, wanted to kill her, really. So she came back to England on a ship, bringing more many money, men and arms um, in 1643. And um, they pursued her through the high seas. Um, she landed at a bay in Yorkshire um, where they, the spies found her, knew where she was staying in this cottage on the quay and uh, their ships, when they entered the bay, you know, bombarded uh, the cottage. And there's a, you know, there are vivid descriptions, uh, which I use in my book of, of her, you know, playing the captain, she says, although a little, although a little, although a little small, she says, um, carrying her dog, her, her toy dog, Mitty, um, under shell fire, bullets flying over her head and with her ladies to a ditch, uh, men being killed only yards from her. Uh, and she survives this and she then travels um, to York um, where um, she's a part of, she sits on the councils of war up there with the Charles is leading general in the north. Charles is in Oxford, which is in the southwest of England. And, um, you know, she's very she's very successful up there. Um, and um, she almost helps Charles win the Civil War in 1643. But unfortunately, he insists she comes to Oxford, which she does. And when she gets there, she he ignores her advice, which is to use the strength, the strong position he's in at that stage, thanks to her, um, to take London. Um, London is fed up with the Civil War and there are some riots going on in London. And she says, now's the time to take London. And he ignores her and um, besieges a provincial town um, uh, called Gloucester instead. And, um, you know, he, and the result is that the parliamentarians reinforce London and he never gets an opportunity to take London again. And the Scots are by this stage are, are, are hoping to enter the civil war on Parliament's side. And Henrietta Maria knows that when they do, the balance of power will tip against the king, the numbers will tip against the king, and the likelihood of him being able to civil, win the civil war is, is, is going to get pretty remote. Mm. And that's when she goes back to France. There's such a human aspect to this. It's easy to say it all as fact, right? It, it, centuries later, we can say these things happen. But when we think to that human aspect of it, I think there was a letter that she had written to Charles um, while he was in England to remind him to think of her or something along the, those lines. Am I right? Oh, yes. I mean, her letters are wonderful, actually. she You really hear her her voice. Um the, you know, because they're very, they're very, <laughs> they alternate between being very loving letters. Um, you know, I do all this for you. you know, I haven't eaten. She describes being on the road for days, not having eaten, um, being very, very tired. Um, but that everything she does, she's doing for him, and she hopes 
that he, you know it, it, it will help him. And she writes him also saying, please, when she's under siege in Exeter, she says to him, please don't don't send an army. I know you'll want to send an army to rescue me, to save me because you love me, but please don't. Um, because you know it, 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 it'd be dangerous for it'd be dangerous for the army, and it'd be better, better for me to die, or better for something bad to happen to me than than um, for, for, than for you to lose. And she's also very worried about being captured. She often says she's very worried about being captured. And for her, she says to her sister as well, Christine. She writes to Italy. She's more worried about being captured than being killed, because she says if she's captured, part the parliamentarians will will blackmail. Charles with my life and you know he, he he won't be able to stand up or he might not be able to stand up to it um so yes it is very human and she also tells him off you know she says you know you made this you know, why are you doing this or why have you done that sort of idiotic decision or you must be tougher with this person or please don't be so wimpy with that person yeah so you very much hear her voice so they are real people and I, I that's one of the things I really do hope that I bring across in my book. So it's one of the things that I, I hope is one of the stronger elements of my book is that is that you do feel these are human beings and that I always try and describe not just um, what they've said in, the, in their letters, because they do express themselves very vividly. There's no need to make up what they're feeling. There's no need to say she thought this or, she, you know, it's written down on the page. And so one can deploy that information, but, but also just know what they're wearing on a particular day. The sun is shining on a particular day. These things are all rooted in the sources. And I think it's very important for as you, when you read a book, when you read a biography, to feel you, you're meeting the person and that they're a human being like you and I are human beings living in extraordinary circumstances. But equally, I would say, um, although none of us are thankfully living in 17th century England or indeed 17th century France, uh, their experiences can resonate with us as well. Um, losing a child, for example, which Henrietta Maria does and the, and the sadness this brings. Some people have this, these, these terrible experiences now. Someone I know has recently done lost a baby, which is so awful, I can barely believe it. But uh, these things still happen. Losing a parent, as Henrietta Maria does, um, when, when Marie de Medici dies. Um, uh, just all the, the human things that happen to all of us, happy things, sad things, frightening things, the abuse, get being abused. Like some of the, some of the things that Henrietta Maria, she makes, she makes a joke of it at one point. She writes to Charles when she's in Holland. She says, she says, oh, well, I'll pray for the man who married that popish brat of France, as the preachers say in London. She says it about herself. I mean, you know, she's being trolled basically by people calling her that popish brat of France, accusing her of being an adulteress and you know, a slut and all these things. And people experience this too now, unfair slanders. And so I hope that that also helps bring her to life and, and you see her as a human being. I'm so happy that you joined us today to discuss this amazing woman in history whom, whom we haven't talked about before on this podcast. And I'm so happy that you were able to hopefully open the eyes to the world, to who Henrietta Maria was, and that there is so much more outside of the Tudors that's equally as fascinating. And I would love it, Leanda, if you told people how they can get a hold of your book. Um, yes, I'd be delighted to do that. Uh, well, uh, you should be able to get it or order it at any good bookshop. It's available at Barnes & Noble, I know, and um, um, also on, on Amazon, of course. Um, so anywhere like that, you should be able to get it. Um, I, I don't know bookshops in the United States well, I'm afraid, but I think it, uh, you should be able to order it from your local, local bookshop without any problem at all. Uh, it's published by Pegasus in the United States. Uh, and by Random House in the United uh, Kingdom. And this was really the tip of the iceberg today. So if you are interested in learning more about Henrietta Maria, I highly recommend that you go out and get Leanda's book. Leanda, thank you so much for joining us again today. Thank you very much for having me. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Tudor's Dynasty podcast. You can follow and support the Tudor's Dynasty podcast on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Patreon at Tudor's Dynasty. Have you heard about the Wolf Hall weekend that's coming up in June 2024? 
No, you must have been living under a rock because this is all everybody is talking about right now. Next June, there is going to be a fantastic event held in Devon, England at Cadhay House in remembrance and honor of Dame Hilary Mantle and her Wolf Hall trilogy. This event is going to be spectacular. There are going to be wonderful speakers there like historians and other authors who maybe knew Hilary Mantle. There's going to be a Tudor feast and so much more at this historic Cadhay House in Devon, England. If you're interested in checking out this event, maybe heading over to England with me next June 2024, check out the link in the show notes for more information. Hope to see you there.